thank you for your support with the silent auction. That really will help us um, continue our mission. And I'm so excited to welcome our panel moderator, um, Amber Nicole Cannon. <laughs> a biomedical artist, a science communicator, art teacher, and general community builder. She's an adjunct at SNU. She is the secretary for the Manchester City Library's Foundation Board and also serves on Manchester City Highway Commission advocating for accessible sidewalks and bike lanes. Mm. She has a strong background in science and anatomy from Case Western Reserve University and Cleveland Institute of Arts Biomedical Art Program. This scientific background helps her connect with non-traditional thinkers. Um, Amber officially founded Unchartered Tutoring, LLC, in August of 2016 after running a number of private education sessions incorporating art and science together. Her experience working in patient education and recruitment in the pharmaceutical clinical trial industry as a biomedical artist made her realize the lack of basic scientific literacy in the general population. It became her passion to educate people about science and health, and she does it every single day. Her artwork focuses around community, disability, science, and education. So we'll give a round of applause to Amber. I'm going to guess that this is on and that you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Can I get thumbs up in the, all the back rows? Yeah. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. So we have what I think is a really fantastic group of panelists. Uh, while I introduce them, I'm really hoping you think about the film and the questions you want to ask the amazing experts we have here, because I don't know of when another opportunity like this will present itself again. So think on the film, think of the questions you want to ask this incredible panel. So if we can move to, I understand the next slide, we'll have the first person I introduce. Um, yes, am I right? Okay, Yasmin Safarzada uh, is the head curator and program director, an Angelino, Persian American, and transplant to New England. She celebrates the intersections of cultural identities and strives to create safe spaces where an individual's sense of self can be discovered instead of being forced to mimic due to people's inherent need to survive. Culture is a rich and complex term and can incorporate an individual's sexual identity, traumas, addictions, heritage, and differently abled living, lived experiences. Her work often encapsulates an absurd and ecstatic celebration of bodies, awkward spaces, anxious burdens, and the global impacts of colonization when confronted with hope and defiance. <laughs> um, so think of the questions you want to ask Yaz. Also, we have Tony Varga, a board certified music therapist, earning his credentials from St. Mary of the Woods College in Indiana. After completing an internship with Roman Music Therapy Services in Wakefield, Massachusetts and becoming certified, Tony acquired accreditation as a neurologic music therapist studying at the Robert F. Unkfer Academy of Neurologic Music Therapy at the University of Toronto. Tony currently works as the music therapy coordinator at the Concord Community Music School and is the owner of Meridian Music Therapy LLC in Milford. Prior to becoming a board certified music therapist, Tony spent over two decades as a public school music educator and orchestra director, most recently working in the Concord School District. He holds a Bachelor of Music from Rutgers University, a Master's of Arts from Rowan University, and a Doctorate of Musical Arts from Boston University. In addition to an extensive academic career, Tony is also a US Navy veteran. <laughs> All right, and now we have Deb Jerkoys. She is a part of NAMI New Hampshire, New Hampshire's, or NAMI New Hampshire Children's Department team. In her role as a family network coordinator, Deb, provide, Deb works to provide access to training and resources aligned with NAMI NH's mission to provide support, education, and advocacy. Deb is enthusiastic about providing access to all youth and their caregivers with the information and tools to support them in their journey with mental illness. Prior to joining NAMI NH, Deb has worked in the public schools, an area agency, and both print and online media. 
Deb teaches yoga in her spare time and enjoys spending time with her family and their dog. Mm -hmm. All right. The final panelist we have to bring, you're thinking of your questions, right? You're thinking of your questions, is Stephen Durast. He's the founder, executive director, and owner of CREATE Center for Expressive Arts, Therapy, and Education in Manchester, New Hampshire, which employs 25 counselors, arts-based therapists, psychologists, interns, and staff. Stephen has an, an, a PhD in expressive therapies, is a licensed mental health counselor, a registered expressive arts therapist, and a certified psychodramatist. His organization, CREATE, is the recipient of the 2010 New Hampshire National Alliance for Mental Illness Award for Systems Change. He most recently co-authored the new edition of Exper Experiential Therapy from Trauma to Post-Traumatic Growth, Therape Therapeutic Spiritual Model Psychodrama 2022, as well as co-authored a chapter called Therapeutic Spiral Model Psychodrama Around the World, Cultural Connections in an IAGP's working with cultural diversity. He also has a very large purple kite that he flies internationally. <laughs> All right. So now I know you guys thought really hard about those questions. Yeah, let's clap. Let's give it up for the panelists because they're an amazing group with a lot of sensitivity and a lot of experience. So does anyone have any questions before I go to our prearranged questions? I really want to hear how the film hit you and what you might want to ask the panelists. I would just have a quick question on how come um, we can drive with all the medicines um, that the film portrayed, you know, Oh, so you're asking a question of how is it that we can drive with all the medications? Well, uh, like as an example, you know, all the, these different drugs that this one lady was on. Yeah. That she was driving. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Would the panel like to address that? I believe there were. Whoop, told you I was going to fall. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what's your question? I, there was a microphone. There we go. answer at the same time. So how is it that we drive and lead with the medication when the art was so therapeutic for her? So you want to know, I'm rephrasing it so that everyone can hear. So how can we drive? Literally drive. Yeah. How, how come, you know, medication is obviously extremely important, um, but also the arts were very therapeutic and important for her as well. So just okay. Looking for the panel to on that. So the, the intersectionality between the medication and the art and driving. As both therapeutic sources. That okay. Are yeah. For healing. Okay. Therapeutic sources that are necessary for healing and driving. I <laughs> okay. I like that. Um, so I'm I'm just going to take time to say that that film was great and immensely triggering, and I need to just yell like. So, cause like, I'm like shaking, like it was incredibly difficult to palpate. So I just need a second. I feel like we should have like shared some snacks or had some sugar afterwards. Like, I'm very sorry, but I, I just, I'm sorry. Second, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what those meds are. It's not my job, right? Like, cause I think the bigger question is like, why is a person with disabilities driving? <laughs> like, is that, so this, those are the thoughts that I have as a result of that. I don't know if anybody else wants to take this. Well, I can't, I can't address the uh, psychiatric medication piece to it, um, and, but I do want to say that in relationship to watching this movie and my reaction to it is that it really showed someone with a you know, great amount of artistic talent engaging in the art as a therapy, and actually it's the process, not the product, that's so important. And so I, you know, anyone who is looking to do art-based therapies uh, to be thinking about, wow, seeing this movie going, man, I could never produce anything like that. That's not the point of the therapy. The therapy is the process. And the art is kind of the documentation of the process. And so it really becomes, um, I think we can lower our anxiety about trying to produce something so lovely and wonderful and move into what would we produce because whatever we would produce in the process would be incredible for us. 
That's right, you can plug. <laughs> I, I think an important part is that it's um, there's no one way to treat mental health or mental illness, right? So a lot of times we really look at a multi-prong approach. And so for what works for one may not work for all. So whether you use a variety of therapies, which could include medicine, which could include art, which could include talk therapy, I think it's important that we as a society have more options now and that's incredibly powerful and um, art we just see it more and more coming to the surface in things and um, and our youth is really using it and so when you talk about the process that's just such an important piece there's an event this month um, that NAMI New Hampshire is part of as part of the children's system of care and that's Magnify Voices and that's for grades 5th through 12 and that's where whether it's poetry or a drawing or a sculpture or a video, the youth of our state are expressing their journey with their mental health. And it's important that we can hear their voice and that we're giving them a platform to communicate with us. There it is, okay, I have my own. <laughs> so to kind of echo what was uh, said by the, the panelists before me, I'm not a medical doctor, but I can speculate that the um, introduction of the um, medications that, w that this woman w was taking was really not so much therapeutic as much to stabilize her. The art was really used more as an expressive element, which was the therapy. Again, the process of being able to express things that she obviously had difficulty doing verbally or even just emotionally to confront some of the, the trauma that she had encountered as a child. So I would, I would say, again, just that the, the medication was really just a, a, a vehicle of being able to put her into an emotional space and place to hold that space so that she can have the ability to express all the wonderful art and the things that she was thinking and be able to really be, express a re very authentic, authentic, excuse me, version of herself. And just to add on to that piece, which is that in trauma processing, there are three stages. The first stage is about safety, skills, and support. And that is where, the, where you're saying is the medication fits into this stabilization piece. Before we can look at the trauma, we have to be stable. We have to have safety, support, and the skills to be able to move towards that. The art was the middle, helped with the middle part, the processing of the trauma. And then there's the reintegration into society. That's the third part. And that was her art show. You know, that was a way of her really integrating back into society as um, the full artist and person that she is, which was the, you know, such an exciting part of watching this particular movie. Um, I would also ask people not to forget that she is an artist. So she is not her trauma, nor is the art a result of the trauma, nor is her talent a result of her mental illness. But like, it's all succinct, right? So we don't think about any of this outside of this is an amazing human being that happened to have all of these other circumstances, but this is an amazing artist. So. Do we have another question from the panel, or I, for the panel? I have a question. It seemed to me that, um, I, I wouldn't say ashamed of the art, but she didn't like it at first. It's, and so that seems very common to individuals that are artists. I, I don't know, I'm not an artist, but it, it takes, um, maybe other people's thoughts or something to, or feedback to help with that? Or is that a correct statement? Could you pass the microphone down so I can run up? Um, I would reference, That's oh, it's on, okay. So is it, what is it? I would, hello. Oh, hi. Do you remember the George Carlin bit where he was like, why don't I come into your office and go do my taxes, man, make me some paperwork. So I think all of, all of you, all of us would feel a bit shy or angsty or like we're not doing a good job if your literal job was to put your vulnerabilities, your work yeah. out there every day for criticism and then to pull it back in and decide, yep, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> so, yeah, here you go. Yes, and the art is the journal. And so imagine someone takes your journal 
and opens it up and reads your most intimate thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so she took her most intimate pieces. One of the most intimate relationships that, she, that Mindy had was that with her and her therapist. And look and, and how much she put into that. Mm -hmm. And then to be so vulnerable to have other people come and look at that, that piece, not knowing what they would think. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add from that? No? Another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dick Wiggins, and I'm a member of NAMI New Hampshire. And I, um, I am a peer support at a uh, transitional facility for people uh, coming out of the hospital and transitioning into the community. And this, this movie really it touched me in, in many different ways. Um, I'm a person that uh, comes from lived experience, and um, you know, this is, uh, I don't try to dissect things, it's just her story. Mm -hmm. And it's made a film of her story. And it's, it's beautiful, and I, I feel that all of our stories are beautiful if expressed in a, in, especially in an artistic way, but even expressed, because if I can get it out, um, it's, it's catharsis. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, this I, I want to thank uh, the people who br brought uh, New Hampshire uh, Fellowship House. Um, I want to thank you for bringing this to all of us, and uh, you know, very impactful. Thank you. Any others? Yes. And this might be something that you're going to answer when you're speaking, but how do people find you? Because I think of people with mental illness, I think of them going to see their primary doctor, then seeing a counselor, and then possibly taking medication. But I would, like, how do people find you who need you who may not think of that as an option? And that's. <laughs> uh, okay, good question. Well, like Dakota was saying, psychologytoday.com is one of the places that we are, but also online. And in your resource bag that you can pick up at the front. <laughs> I think we can always do better. And there's, you know, there's always ways we look. But for NAMI New Hampshire, we are, you know, we have lots of email blurbs and we have our our newsletter and we're in the schools too and I think that's an important piece because we're really trying to address the youth audience and be accessible. So um, I was at a training at a high school a couple weeks ago and it was really powerful because this is the Connect Youth Leader training and this is to support teenagers knowing how to support their peers and not to handle the crisis themselves but know how to connect to NAMI New Hampshire to call 988 or if it's a situation to call 911. So we're really trying to get that education into multiple places, but I think getting it into the youth is a really important piece. And one of the most powerful things I heard that day was, I want my parents to hear this information. So that also reminds us of how do we bring this to the family unit so everyone has that information. For um, music therapists, one of the primary spots to online to be able to locate a local music therapist would be the AMTA.org, which is the American Music Therapy Association. Um, that they're the governing agency that oversees the training and um, practices of for licensed music educator, uh, music therapists, excuse me. And um, for the Concord Community Music School in general, Practically any community music school would be a viable place to be able to look for a um, expressive arts therapy. Here in Concord, we're fortunate because in addition to offering music therapy, we also have dance movement therapy. This is Heather Hearn, who is one of my colleagues. She's our dance music therapist. And um, so it, it's a, an option to be able to look online to your local like music community music resources and everything. Um, we are unfortunately not very populated in terms of music therapists in the state of New Hampshire compared to Massachusetts, where you probably would find one about as, as close as you would find a Dunkin' Donuts, right, right, like right six feet next to each other. But for um, New Hampshire, 
primarily the community music schools are the, the primary place that you would find the a music therapist and i assume probably the same thing with dance and movement therapist heather yeah you can find well create a, has a, a dance movement therapist mm -hmm. i believe right or yeah. intern yeah intern yeah 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 so you can find some of All right, so more resources. Oh, and we have more questions here. I, I happen to see the orange shirt first, or peach shirt first, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you the remote, and then we'll ask Do you mind if I also shared yes. some of our resources? Yes, okay. please. Thank you so much. So I think last year alone, we gave out $30,000 in subsidized tuition for all of our classes. So we really specialize in being a truly inclusive art-making space. But we've also identified that the state has particular needs. So my department specifically is very, well, it's actually the entire philosophy of the Kimball Jenkins, you know, entity is to target underserved populations. So we are very, very unique in that our receptions, which are completely open to the public, are some of the most diverse arts and cultural receptions that people have ever been to. And we also make very strategic partnerships with organizations that are uplifting BIPOC, queer, and differently abled individuals. So I'd really recommend if you're interested in getting involved, in volunteering, in taking a class, in saying hello, in anything, to really just reach out. We're right down the street, so thank you. So I work for um, an organization that tries to help physician practices um, with access to mental health and trauma-informed care, and uh, we do that throughout the state. So one of my questions was kind of builds on what um, I think it was Isaac, is that <laughs> said about um, where are you located? We work with a lot of communities up in Coas and you know, just some of these very, very rural areas. Have any of you explored any um, ideas of doing this like via um, web, um, online services, or that might expand some of your networks to be able to reach some of these really, really rural communities where they're still facing these kinds of trauma and, and access is even more limited up in those areas. Yeah, I think during the time of the pandemic, we definitely delved deep into the online classes. I think one of our biggest strengths is finding organizations and people who are doing this and not reinventing the wheel and giving them resources and support. So um, Positive Street Art Down in Ashua, again, um, I am interested in people of color and queer people specifically. It's very important to me that my communities are safe in this state that is pretty homogenous. So um, Positive Street Art are some of the people that we partner with and also Queer Elective, we've become their fiscal agent. So I think our strength is in finding individuals and uplifting them so that they can continue their good work while we are supporting them with the established name and the resources that we have. H hasn't Kimball Jenkins also traveled a little north for some education classes? Well, we, yeah, we have like remote outreach. So we work with our organizations to go to where they are because we don't like, there's a um, few refugee apartments. Again, this is my interest, but we will go to a local park and just host events there with them and for them and feed people. Or we utilize the MTA to just, okay, transportation is an issue with you. We've paid for transportation and we've paid individuals on the ground who have really unique skill sets because, but they, because they don't look like or know how to write a resume out, it's really hard for them to acquire a job. We've paid these facilitators to help bring their communities onto the public transit that we've utilized, because I guess it's really unique. It's interesting, the MTA is not being utilized, so you can rent the public transit vehicles, and so we do, so that's really interesting. Uh, Create does provide telehealth services for people who are 
in New Hampshire. The client has to be in New Hampshire for us to be able to uh, service them. But we have, I have four clinicians, four full-time clinicians who are completely just telehealth and uh, several who are part-time but completely telehealth. And then our other um, full-time people are, you know, will do telehealth and on-site services. Um, with NAMI New Hampshire, we have definitely made the shift to have many of our programs online, and that's been amazing to provide access. And I think in-person events certainly are coming back and have a value, and I think, you know, we're trying to be strategic with that. So with the Children's System of Care, with this Magnify Voices event that's happening at the end of the month, that Expressive Arts Contest is going to be at Plymouth State University, and it has historically been more in the southern region of the state. And so we're doing that to provide a greater level of access. We've also worked with the Endowment for Health and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to bring the screening of Anxious Nation to the state this month, and those screenings Screenings are going to be throughout the state and that's available online and so again trying to address all of our communities um, because we don't want to leave anyone out I think just the one last thing I'd say about online is that it's sensitive the information we're talking about and we really need to be careful that we're providing a safe and structured environment so that's why it's exciting that we're gonna have these like tonight we're here in person right this was this was a lot to take in but we're now getting to process it after so even when we do something online we have some rules around if you're gonna step away let me know where you're going don't turn your camera off if you're not gonna tell me why and that's not because we're making rules we're trying to provide a safe environment Music therapy certainly is one of the um, expressive arts therapies that can be effectively delivered via telehealth. One of the things I would caution, though, about that is I will tell you um, that a majority of the clients that I see in person now, particularly that are of adolescent or younger age, come to see me because of isolation and social issues that were brought on from a uh, over a year of tele telecommunications and Zoom meetings. So it's a matter of whether it's going to become a, a contraindication or if it's going to actually be assisting what the actual um, help is that the, the client needs. Uh, certainly, as I said, we can, we can do it and we do offer it as an option if someone would like to. We almost never have anyone take that advantage, though, because they, people prefer the in-person contact. Can I just add one more thing? I think we'd be remiss not to acknowledge the staffing crisis that we're experiencing in the state. And so I think we're all trying to get creative in that as well, because it's, it is a real problem. We have peer support specialists throughout the state. They do amazing work. Um, and they are they are really pushed to their max. So that's that's really a challenge too. So thank you for everyone that's on the ground and doing this work because it's a lot. Thank you. Hello. Um, this is in relationship to the movie, and um, I'm not sure if it's really a question or a comment. But I was really struck by the fact that I mean, she was obviously drawn to art at a very young age. But it became therapeutic as it started, as the art started to draw out these subconscious traumas. And it made me think that it's therapeutic, but it could also be additionally traumatic. <laughs> um, because it seemed to me that she didn't have knowledge of these things, and they just started appearing on the page. Um, so I don't know, it's not really a question, but I, I'm an art teacher, and I work in a therapeutic day school, and. Sometimes I wonder if I'm heading into territory that I'm not prepared to handle. I, I heard a question in, the, in that. <laughs> I, I did, I did. And, and, and it was, you know, when using art with a, a student, perhaps, like we can come to uh, challenging things. And how, how do those of us without your training, without your experiences, how do we help? Does that make sense? I think that's the yeah. question, yeah. I think that, um, like again, from my personal experience with discipline, knowing a little bit about the, the student or the client's background. Uh, for example, if I had a client that was, um, had a particular affinity for, say, very loud 
uh, heavy metal, death metal music, and they're suffering depression, that may not be the best choice for them. On the other hand, that's also a very stereotypical profile. So the other thing to do is that may be the only way that they can express themselves. Just like Mindy's only way to express herself was through her art. The art evolved as part of being her voice that she didn't have to express what was what she was thinking inside her. I think probably my best um, speculation on to answer that is to just be there as a solid support system and holding that space for that expression to be able to happen and look for those signs of trauma and distress so that at that point you can intervene. But the one of the I keep going back to something that I was um, taught by a supervisor of mine when I was an intern, which incidentally I did the entire seven months online. So, so ther therapy can be done on, on uh, Zoom. But in any case, she told me, she kept having to remind me of this, especially with me coming from an educator's background. Those of you with a teaching background can appreciate this. As a therapist, you're not there to make anything happen. You're there to be able to provide a safe space to let it happen. And sometimes that can be scary because your, your instinct is that you want to intervene and make it better. But that's not really what our job is as a therapist. It's to kind of be there and coach them and hold that space for them so they can resolve these things. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Um, I think I'm coming to terms with, I'm not technically a therapist. I'm just a person that's a safe space. And I work in a lot of really difficult environments. There is training, like UNH had a great youth in crisis training. They have an adult one coming up, but like it's really not a blanket statement or answer. It's really dependent on who you are, what your occupation is, and where you're at. Um, you know, like I have some teachers that come to me and they're like, I don't know what all this non-binary this and that is. And you're like, cool, it's not your job. Like if a student expresses themselves to you, be receptive and move on. You don't need to talk about their sex gender identity, right? If they're feeling a certain way, there are counselors and things like this. So I also, I really like what you said, sir. Um, this is a movie. And so again, dissecting or sort of trying to like, uh, play doctor with this, again, artist. I don't know when the uh, memories were triggered. I'm not like there. It was to serve a purpose um, about an occupation and a person in that occupation living their life. Um, I find that to be very unique. I also, as an artist, am very, very cautious of my work or any work that's being consumed by the public to be taken as reality artists, movie makers, all of this, we are illusionists. We create something for you to consume, which has a message that we want to give you. So just be wary of artists. We're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> We're not to be trusted. <laughs> hey, I'm sitting right next to you. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to go back to your question, um, and it, it, as a, if a student came and said the same thing to you as that is what is being expressed in the art, what would you do? And that, because uh, art is a language. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, you know, see it as the language and read it as the language, if it's a language of distress, mm -hmm. then what would you do if the same student came to you and spoke distress to you mm -hmm. and then react that way? Okay, do we have any other questions? I missed an arm. I missed an arm. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I, um, I have a, a little bit of an issue. I guess I, I'm also an art educator, 16 years in public schools in Manchester, and I 
I struggle with the idea of um, watching the movie and her work is extremely powerful from the beginning. And I struggle with the fact that it wasn't seen until, like really represented until later in life. So I wonder, you know, I mean, I cared very deeply for my students, um, like all day, it keeps me up at night. But like, how do we do a better job? Because it's great to hear all this, but like I go into my, into my school and I could tell you that m staff members of mine, they, they're not looking at this the same way. And mental health is still taboo and we're still not talking about it. We're still not do the access. I mean, it's it, the the. I mean, in the shortage, we have shortages. So how do we do a better job? I mean, it's great that y'all are here, but like some of my kids, they don't have transportation to get to your studio. That you know, they don't have internet to do an online class with you. They don't have money to take it. Mm. How do we get? And these and the and people, young people who are being diagnosed with mental health issues are either not being diagnosed and probably a majority of them are already coming from impoverished families and split families. So how do we do a better job in our state to create a greater access and resource for our kids at a younger age so she could have actually therapeutically gone through her trauma? <laughs> Maybe not when she, whatever her age was, 60? 27, <laughs> Yeah, like instead of, in, you know, but before resorting to shock therapy, because right. I believe that we can. But how do we do that? I and mean, it's a collective issue, I know that, but I mean, we could sit here and we can leave and be like, oh, that was great. But what are those next steps? What are laws? What can we fight for in legislation to get this in Coos County? I mean, how do we get this? Beyond this conversation with a lot of people that are not in school. <laughs> yeah. But what are those resources? Can you share things that we can do? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ignorant to it. But I'm, I'm here for it. I'm screaming at it every day at my school. But I can't convince the adults I work with to do that. Or the school district. Thank you for talking about legislation because it's a legislative season and for NAMI New Hampshire, we put a lot of effort into being there and being present for supporting and opposing and really looking at how we support mental health and a lot of the legislation, legislation I cannot say that word, excuse me, <laughs> the legislation this year has really been focused around our youth and our schools and what's happening. So be involved. We have a public policy update. It's a weekly email that gives you information about what's going on. So we'll do some of the heavy lifting in terms of letting you know what's out there and what's happening. We do a training in the fall. It's called It's Your Move. And we train on how to be an advocate and whether that means that you T share your story in the class or you take it to the legislation either legislator either way we're giving you the information and the tools and so that's just one piece but you did bring up that and I think it's an important one but be involved and ask the questions I think part of it is um, there's programs and systems that we can change but it also starts with all of us here check in with the person next to you, see if they're okay. Are the family, the friend, the counselor, the art teacher, check in with these kids because there's so much going on when, I mean, I know I keep referring to the school, but I was at a school a few weeks ago and more than, more than two students in a small group of students had been on the phone all night with a, a friend who was in trouble. So there's really a lot going on and we need to continue to ask questions and see if people are okay and check on our neighbor. Um, so I feel rather inadequate with your question, but I did have also a question like, where's that targeted? Like, where is the representation in this room of our youth? Or, you know, again, of people of color, like there's a few of us. Okay, again, like, and so when I walk into a room like this, I get immediately uncomfortable. I get immediately on edge. And so I am, I, I feel compared to these professionals like a little bit like kind of a runt, but like when we do our programming, we partner with, again, nonprofits that are actually on the ground doing the work. So my turn, 
Waypoint, these are great examples. So why instead of when I look at big institutions, and again, this is the arts, and so I do have to really take a look at myself and go, you got like, you know, we, we make shit stuff pretty, you know what I mean? So like, but instead of reinventing in the meal, we, wheel making programming that's for, for people who already have everything, why don't we go in, put our resources, our labor into spaces that need it, work with organizations and nonprofits that need it? This is very unique. I enjoy this very much. Support teachers like yourself who are doing it. This is very interesting to me. Um, I do see it's really interesting being on the ground sometimes and seeing the differences between people who are actually teaching day in and day out and people in the district level making those choices and then politicians talking about the people on the ground. It's, it's very separate. It's kind of insane, so I... Not kind of insane. <laughs> it's absolutely, well, I'm being recorded, but I think I already dropped an F, <laughs> a pretty big F bomb. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go out on a professional limb here as a current music educator and a music therapist. I think that part of it, part of your answer would be with the Department of uh, Education at the state level because we are inundated with state standards of how we should teach that mandate the curriculum that is totally product centered rather than process centered. and. What I personally do in a lot of my classrooms, um, they, could, they are now catching up with every, the uh, buzzwords of um, social emotional learning. That should have been a priority over like 20 years ago. Because when people ask me, what do you teach? They expect to hear my subject. I tell them I teach kids. Mm -hmm. I happen to teach them music, but I teach kids. And I think that a lot of our um, curricular mandates and everything that come down that tell us what we should be teaching, how long we should be teaching, and getting ready for whichever garden variety um, state assessment is coming down the pike that we have to be able to prove our worth for, I think that what happens is we lose sight of the kids. The, the content becomes the priority instead of the boy or girl or the, the, I will say for, for to be more sensitive, um, for non-binary non uh, students, the individual, the person sitting in front of us, they matter more than the content. Certainly children need to learn how to read and write and, and add and all of those things. But in a content like ours, I think you, it, it's pretty obvious to see how rich that, th th this content, the arts are across the board in being able to provide these social emotional needs to provide for those, but we seldom have opportunities to do that. Uh, to that topic, what do you think about uh, Florida firing a teacher for teaching about the Statue of David? I mean, like, it's crazy, it's insane. Like, I just, I just like, I get so angry. Like, I'm a total metalhead, so when he said that, I was like, yes. <laughs> like, I listen to Death Metal in my car, and people are like, what is that? But like, oh, no, no, I know, that is my therapy. So, all, all, like, all music is, is The stuff that's going on politically good. right now, is, yeah. as far as the stuff like taking books out of schools and stuff, is, I don't have any kids, and it's upsetting to me. I worked in mental health since I was 19, but, like, it's very upsetting to me. And I can only imagine what it does to you all. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add to that, um, and it's probably on our closing question thing because we're about to go over. We are technically too over. Um, sorry, folks. Um, I think that that's a really great point in, in taking it to like some of the things that teachers are certainly seeing in the schools that I've, I've heard from my friends who are all day, every day teachers that, um, and there are things that are societally driven that are is is it is it mental health or is it just a reaction to a world that's deeply challenging i think there's a point of acceptance 
and access, right? And so part of what I like about the fact that, you know, this film is showing in a different way, right, with art and the therapy and just the fact that we're all unique. And so I, I think about art as a household where I, not only do we have our mental health challenges, but we also have um, individuals with autism. And so the communication isn't straightforward and talk therapy isn't going to necessarily be the best option. And so um, I see art used so productively. And so I think what I wanna see is a world where we have more and more options, not that we're starting to close down those options. And I'm looking for a world with mental health, world domination. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so oftentimes I have to take a bird's eye view of things because when you're on the ground or when your friends around you are saying that uh, we've, uh, a lot of our trans community members are actively in constant trauma because we continue to go after our friends and I don't know why. So there was a great <laughs> Egyptologist in the Dr. Kara Santa Maria show and she said that we're in a post-patriarchal revolution. This is a big upswing right now in attacks on women and people of color and queer people because you no longer as a straight white man get your 40 acres and a mule. It's over. Now you have to compete with the rest of us. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if a man is competing with me, it's over. I've had to work my entire life twice as hard. It's done. So this is very, um, not challenging, but it's like uh, threatening to people. I, I have to look at it this way because a lot of us, when we get home, we're so tired. We don't work eight hour days. We work way longer than this. Mm -hmm. We collapse, we are empty, and you know, it, there's those substance abuse issues as well. Like, it is exhausting to continue this work all the time. So there, I have to remove myself and go, yo man, let's take a 2000 year perspective real quick, so. All right, I'll just, I'll yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's the closing yeah. remarks. It's the closing it's remarks okay. here. We've got one more person up here that's been so patient. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. I couldn't oh. see your hand. We can go to her. You might be here, but thank you. Are you going to speak? No, go ahead, go right oh. ahead, please. Okay. Did you? Well, uh, my name is Irene Bouchine, and I'm a children's mental health advocate. And I work with NAMI, and I've done the training, and I, Judge Broderick and I have become a, partners in that if you've ever listened to Judge Breyer talk about his work with children in the schools, thousands and thousands of kids talking to children about mental health and his own personal issue, and then finding out as they come to see him before he leaves this, the auditorium, they line up out the outside and he hugs every single one of them, and they tell him all of his, their life story. They cry, they're, adult, they're middle school, they're high school, they're scared, they have mental health issues, all over the place, from adults, from themselves, from their friends. So um, I'm a parent of a child who struggled with mental illness since he was about five. I'm also a creative and I'm also someone who is disabled. And I didn't learn to read till I was 34 years old. But what I did learn was how to be creative. What I was, was creative. So I didn't expect to do this, but over the years I started writing. Remind I didn't really read till I was 34, and I didn't start writing till 2006, but I did start writing, and the stories I found out about myself were remarkable. But not that's not the point. The point is that in a whole other time, my subconscious as a creative started a whole book. And the book is the book I use today to advocate with children, with Judge Broderick, with the school systems, whatever they let me in. And it's, it's called Celia and the Little Boy. I'm not trying to sell my book. I'm trying to tell you that the story of Celia and the bo Little Boy is a story of two children who become trapped in the darkness of depression and what it takes for them to find their way out. And it's a story about hope and resilience and finding a doorway when the world looks completely shut out. And it is to be me and to listen to this and to know that there are resources but they're not in the system and they don't pass the rules and they don't, you know, all of the things that Sue just said, there's all these tears. These are the tears. I, I mean, I, I, could do my, I could do my work all day long. All day long. Get out there, talk to kids, talk to parents. And I have been for <coughs> four years in the state. Libraries, community programs, wherever they will see me. But 
I just want you to know that there are people like myself, because I met many advocates, who are out there really fighting hard, <coughs> but you won't see us because we don't, we aren't in the systems. Mm -hmm. We aren't in the government, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a legislator. I'm not a million other things. But what I am is really, really committed to what I do. So I just wanted to make a point. Letting you know I was here, mm -hmm. so you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think everyone here is probably trying to get in through whatever cracks they can find or big gaping holes in a lot of cases all the time. Um, absolutely. And did you want to continue? Yes, first of all, thank you for sharing that. It's, that that's, I, f I find just by, by the sheer math of what you were sharing about when you've learned all of these things that is in, in absolutely incredible, it really is. And, and I, I applaud you for, for all of your determination and your persistence with being able to do that and to, to advocate. Um, of course, being, being a musician, I know we have to watch out for the artists, but <laughs> musicians are just as weird. We're an artist. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, so, that's right. So, I, I just want to say that, you know, I mean, to, to wrap up the evening, and we all seem to have a, a mutual sense of compassion for the um, mental health community and, and what we would like to do to solve all the problems with it. But I just have to hearken back to the fact that I think about 50 years ago, John Lennon had it, said it best when he said, imagine. You know, and, then, and I, I won't recite every single lyric to that song, but just imagine, you know that if it was able, if, if we were able to do it back then, we probably wouldn't be facing the issues that we have now. So, I guess with that, I'll just let it be. Yeah. <laughs> kudos, kudos on that one. Yeah, big round of applause for our panelists and their extensive experience and their education and their willingness to speak with us tonight. And that I end it off. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. We do have a gift for each of our panelists that we want to give. This is also another piece of therapy, chocolate from Granite <laughs> State. We all always need chocolate. So uh, we are so happy that you all joined us this evening. And thank you so much. And I think, Herb, you are going to say a few words. Yes, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here uh, this evening. May is National uh, Behavioral Health Awareness Month. And so this was our way of recognizing that um, this year. And we hope to do this again next year with a different set of uh, panelists and topic. And um, Judge Broderick, uh, Justice Broderick was unable to be with us this evening, um, but he certainly sends his, uh, his best to us. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>